Welcome to our second webinar on Community Violence Prevention and Prevention Initiative. It is both an honor and a privilege to be here today. I'd like to introduce my good friend and colleague, Jim Mantel, who is the Associate Administrator for ODDP's Delinquency Prevention and Child Protection Division. Jim has over 30 years of experience working in the field of juvenile justice, child welfare, and mental health, and has been with OJDP since 2007, where he continues to provide leadership on national mentoring programs, youth violence prevention strategies, missing and exploited children's programs, and child protection issues. Jim? All right, thanks, Eddie. Hi, everyone. As Eddie said, I'm Jim Antel, Associate Administrator of the Delinquency Prevention and Child Protection Division at the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, or OJJDP. OJJDP is a sister agency of the Bureau of Justice Assistance and a component of the Office of Justice Programs. I'm standing in today for OJJDP Administrator Liz Ryan, who unfortunately is unable to be with us today. Liz is supportive of this work and regrets she wasn't able to speak with you today. With these webinars, the Office of Justice Programs aims to provide practical information that can help the field implement community violence intervention strategies. Today, we are going to focus on the importance of collaboration. As we strive to address community violence, collaboration isn't just important, it is essential to interrupting violence and empowering communities. OJJDP has a long history of supporting community-led, evidence-informed strategies to address violence. For decades, we have been funding youth violence prevention and early intervention programming to meet the needs of youth at high risk for violence and victimization. One example of this investment in prevention is our robust mentoring initiatives, which received more than $89 million in fiscal year 2021 alone. We are also proud to support community efforts across the country to deter youth from joining gangs and to reduce youth gang activity. Our current efforts to implement community-based violence intervention strategies are heavily informed by this work. For instance, we know from our previous efforts that programs work best when we directly engage the community and the youth being served from day one. We don't pursue these programs for communities, we build them with communities. So let's begin with some encouraging news. According to the most recent OJJDP data released this summer, youth arrests for violent crime, which includes murder, robbery, and aggravated assault, had declined since 1995 and reaching a new low in 2020. That number is 78% below the 1994 peak and 50% less than the number of youth arrested in 2010 for the same crime categories. The decrease in youth arrests isn't only limited to violent crime. Arrests for all offenses involving youth fell 84% between 1996 and 2020. The total youth arrests in 2020, which were just over 424,000, represents a 38% drop from the previous year and half the number from five years earlier. Now, OJJDP is aware of the reports that some communities may be experiencing an uptick in certain crimes among young people. And while we are concerned by these reports, and we will continue to track them, these data, the latest available, confirm that the field's efforts to transform the juvenile justice system into one that emphasizes safety, opportunities, and potential is making a real impact in the fight against youth crime. It's time that our methods for working with at-risk youth and young people in the juvenile justice system change to reflect the reality of youth crime. We aren't dealing with bad kids. We're trying to help children who sometimes make bad choices. And this brings me to OJJDP's priorities. They are first, treating children as children. Second, serving children at home in their communities with their families. And third, opening up opportunities for system-involved youth. Community-based violence intervention strategies fit very well with these priorities. The strategies focus on serving youth in the communities where they live using local supports. Today, several of our grantees have joined us to talk about their violence prevention and intervention initiatives. 
Their efforts provide real opportunities and options for youth. All the initiatives you'll hear about meet children where they are, both cognitively and emotionally. They address risk factors in youth lives and they support family engagement. Now at the foundation of OJJDP's three priorities are two essential principles, commitment to pursue racial equity and fairness and a vow to listen to impacted young people and their families. I know that our grantees and partners share these commitments. Uh, throughout this past summer, OJJDP held listening sessions with professionals in the field and town halls with system-involved youth. We received input from stakeholders in nearly every state and territory. Perhaps the most powerful feedback we received was that we must always think of youth in the juvenile justice system as our kids, not their kids. We must treat system-involved youth the same way we'd want our own children to be treated. We are incorporating all this feedback we received into an OJJDP action plan, which will be released by the end of this year. In addition to listening, OJJDP is also providing tools and assistance to the field. Our model programs guide is a free resource that contains information about evidence-based prevention, intervention, and reentry programs. It helps practitioners and communities learn what works, what is promising, and what does not work in juvenile justice and child protection. I encourage you all to use this tool as you seek to implement solutions for young people. Our office also provides training and technical assistance to help our grantees apply best practices and learn about promising approaches. You can find the model programs guides and more information on training and technical assistance on the OJJDP website. At OJJDP, we strongly believe that together we can transform the youth justice system and provide young people with clear pathways to positive futures, which brings me back to the importance of collaboration. Today, you'll hear a lot about collaboration between state and local leaders, law enforcement, and community-based violence intervention providers. One theme that will quickly emerge is the importance of mutual respect. From police officers to pastors, every single person involved in helping communities stop the violence must understand that their work is part of a network. For our part, we are thrilled to be collaborating with our sister offices on this webinar series to lift up the OJP Community-Based Violence Intervention and Prevention Initiative. No one can stop the violence alone, and the only way to foster real collaboration is by respecting and understanding the vital role that each person has to play in building safer, stronger communities. When we collaborate to build safe communities, children will be free to grow and bound to prosper. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy this webinar. Thank you, Jim. It's, uh, it's really incredible to work aside with you and, and see how we continue to bridge some of our best practices here at OJP, uh, particularly the number of years we've been working in this space. So last month, we kicked off our five-part webinar series on community violence prevention and prevention initiative. Today's webinar will continue to build on the importance of collaboration, similar to what this Jim pointed out, particularly from the perspective of young people and those who serve them. The overall goals for this webinar series continues to be centered around one, commitment to collaboration, two, building an ecosystem of community safety, and three, advancing best practices in building safer communities. As I think about today's conversation, I reflect in my years of working at the YMCA of Chicago as an executive director leading our youth safety and violence prevention efforts. While there are many lessons that I learned during that time, I'd like to share three that are relevant to today's conversation. The first, not every at-risk young person is a high-risk young person. It's important that we distinguish these two categories of young people because they require a different intervention. There's also plenty of evidence that demonstrates the harm that can come when mixing these two groups together. And it makes it more difficult to demonstrate the impact of the intervention. Second, in my last year at the YMCA, nearly a dozen of young men were killed in our program. All but one was over the age of 18. 
When you look at police stat uh, statistics on who is likely to shoot or be shot, the highest concentration is those between the ages of 18 and 29, with a slightly higher percentage going to those between the ages of 18 and 24. This fact was important for many reasons, one of which allowed us to be a stronger advocate for early emerging adults. Three, our partnership with local police, juvenile probation, and alternative schools allowed us to better identify and serve those at greater risk of victimization and perpetration, including who to partner with for additional services. Much of what I just shared isn't a surprise for many of you, which is why in the spring of 2022, BGA released a community-based violence intervention and prevention implementation checklist. You might have heard us referencing this back in our first webinar. The purpose of this checklist was to establish a common definition of CBI and create an accessible and realistic tool that provides guidance to the field on planning and implementing CBI strategies. BGA staff work closely with two, partner, two partners, Local Initiative Support Cooperation, which is LIST, and CNA, Centers for Justice Research and Innovation, as well as OJP and DOJ colleagues over the course of about six months to develop this tool. A range of sources were used to develop this checklist, the most important of which was experts and input, such as those on this call. In October of 2021, BGA held a series of listening, a listening series with 150 representatives from each, from whether it's research, public health, law enforcement, social services, community engagement, and street outreach sectors. And again, to which some of you are actually on this call. Our work has heavily informed by the field and experts provided both the framework and much of the content for this checklist. In our first webinar last month, LeVar from LIS introduced the checklist and went over guiding principles for CBI strategies, including being community-centered, equity and inclusion focused, evidence-informed, and effective and sustainable. This checklist also provides a working definition of CBI strategies, as well as a list of common elements among the range of strategies. But the key goal of this tool is to provide guidance or a roadmap of things to think about through all the stages and planning of implementation of CBI strategies. These stages include engaging community members, forming community collaborations, which can tell you, can tell you firsthand that it sounds great on paper, but difficult to implement. Selecting CBI strategies that fit your community needs, maintaining mechanisms for consistent feedback, management structure and relationship building, measuring the impact of strategies and sustaining the continuous improvement of programs is at the core of what we're trying to do here and the purpose of these webinars. It is our hope that this webinar series brings many of the key elements of the checklist to life for participants and creates an opportunity to dive a little deeper into these issues than the checklist was able to go. If you're not yet familiar with the checklist, we encourage you to check it out at our link provided in the resources list for the webinar. Before I pass the baton, I do want to take a second here to encourage and ask our listeners uh, to please ask questions uh, in our Q&A, uh, but also help us pass the word, help us spread the word of the work that we're doing here as a collective effort in DOJ and with our colleagues on the ground. We need you to continue to express the need for these resources, for the need to support this population. And so we ask that throughout these next two hours, uh, pick up your phone, send a tweet, please engage, uh, your colleagues and friends uh, to help us encourage others to better understand this work. Uh, having said all of that, I do want to take a second to introduce our two esteemed uh, moderators today. Uh, Robert uh, Sr. has served as a youth and gang violence prevention coordinator for the city of Danville, Virginia, since 2018. Before that, 
he worked as a juvenile court counselor for the North Carolina Department of Public Safety and as a probation parole officer for Richmond County, North Carolina. Mr. David has many years of experience working with gang involved and at risk youth, as well as being a recognized motivational speaker. Our second moderator, someone who I really respect, is Dr. Celeste, who serves as a senior research associate for the Institute for Intergovernmental Research, where she leverages her more than 25 years as a practitioner. From her work as a project director of one of the first OJDP comprehensive gang model sites, to her role as a victim advocate, case manage manager, and supervisor in the field of social services. Dr. Celeste continues to demonstrate her commitment to comprehensive solutions that promote the long-term well-being of children, youth, and families in her current work, where she provides hands-on technical assistance for ODP grantees, project sites who are working on this issue uh, to prevent and to reduce youth violence. So before I pass it on to them, I'll take a second here to show an illustrator video. In Danville, several at-risk teenagers are getting a chance to turn their lives around. The, pro the goal of Project Imagine is to not only help them, but to continue to reduce crime throughout the city. WDBJ7's Ashley Bowles is live. So, Ashley, this program will start again on Monday. Is there anything different about it this time around? Well, Robin, the setup of the program is very similar as it was in the fall. Teens get placed in different jobs with either city departments or local businesses. They work for nine weeks and attend meetings. But this time around, there's more insight, more interest, and more diversity. Growing up is hard to do. I've been looking for jobs ever since, and it's been hard. I also have a baby, so it's hard. Later on in the day, I got locked up. A couple years ago, I was hanging with the wrong people. I got locked up. I was locked up two and a half years. Because everyone has a different story. Daniel Sims. Oh, no, I did the same program y'all was in. So I got to talk to y'all about it. Has made some positive life changes. And it all started last fall through Project Imagine. When I first checked, my mom I was like, I'm proud of you. That was the first time hearing those three words in years. I don't believe anyone should be judged at where they are at 17. And if you can look back and think of the dumb decisions that you made at 17, is that an indicator of your whole life? No. Robert David led Sims and others through Project Imagine. He's getting ready to start it again with some new faces. These young people that are out here committing these crimes and shooting, they still have value. And if you believe that they're throwaways and you've given up on the American dream. We're trying to impact these young people at a very young age to make positive life choices. So for the next nine weeks, these young adults will work various jobs, get paid, learn how to manage money, and hopefully... This is the main thing that actually got me off probation. If I wouldn't have done this, I'd probably still be doing it for another 18 months. Graduate with a brand new mindset when it comes to growing up. And that's what Project Imagine is all about, imagining a better future despite of where you are right now. And this is the first time that a girl has been a part of the group. And Robin, from a law enforcement perspective, Lieutenant Chivas also added that this is just one more thing to help the community with their goal of diminishing violent crimes. And having some success stories as well, Ashley Bowles. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Robert Davis, so let's kind of clear this up because I, I know I look like law enforcement, but I'm not. Uh, back in 2018, the city had uh, a, a rash of homicides, gang-related homicides that were comparable. Well, actually, 2016-17, but in 2018, they sought help and they adopted the Office of Juvenile Justice Delinquency Prevention Comprehensive Gang Model. And uh, the, the, the shootings were comparable to uh, per capita of Chicago, so they really need some answers. So they adopted a model, created this position. So when I came into this position, uh, Danville had nothing. Uh, so one of the first things I had to do, not being from Danville, uh, I'm from North Carolina, is that I had to develop a relationship because it's impossible to create something for an organ for people uh, in a community that you don't know and you don't know their needs because we create programs for the community and not for ourselves. So the way we came up with Project Imagine is that the city was going through a revitalization. And as you can see, the, 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 uh, 
the kind of moniker was reimagine that. And so I asked the city manager, I said, how can you reimagine something that you never had an image of? So that's why we call it the project Imagine. Um, so you can put it in perspective. I work in the city manager's office. Uh, again, I know I look like law enforcement, but I'm not. Uh, it comes out of city manager office, but we work in conjunction with law enforcement. So coming into the community, one of some of the first things that I did, uh, it was just me, uh, no team or anything like that. So I went out in the community. I just hung around. I went to the barbershops. So, uh, I met the matriarchs and the patriarchs of the communities. I handed my card out to any and everyone. It could be a homeless person on the street at, at Walmart, and I would give my card uh, because you have to make that correct contact because when you come into a community that suffered uh, that, that type of violence, there's a level of trust, there's a level of trauma, there's a level of pain and all those things. And you have to break through that by letting people know you're there for them. And this is not a photo op and this is not something you're just doing face value that you're really engaged into the community. So that, uh, that relationship d d directly and indirectly uh, it is necessary. The other thing that I had to do in order to develop Project Imagine was um, create collaborations with agencies, whether it's um, workforce development, the city in and of itself, other agencies, community members, mentors. Uh, Project Imagine was pulled together by collaboration. One thing that Danville had, Danville was, collab was, was resource rich, but collaboration poor. Uh, some of you guys may be in some cities where you have a lot of resources, but not a lot of collaboration. And, and, and that was necessary in order to create this program because as you see at the last one, started with no budget. This, when I came in in 2018, the city gave me a beautiful mahogany desk, a beautiful desk and, and probably one of the, the largest offices in city hall, but no budget. So, uh, but they would still need to create something. So essentially uh, we pulled those uh, individuals together. Uh, you'll go to the next slide, please. So essentially what I did was, so there was already money through Workforce Innovative uh, Opportunity Act, we all act, and there was money there, but it wasn't being used because the population wasn't there. Well, I knew I could get the population there and the population was already there through mentors and uh, the Department of Juvenile Justice. So talking to WIOA and saying, okay, they have a nine week program that, that, that was already existing, but they didn't have the, the, the people that was from 16 to 24. So that was the funding source. Uh, getting with probation and parole and mentors who had individuals, high risk individuals who needed those resources, and, but didn't, didn't know how because of barriers, bringing those together. And then the last piece was the city of Danville. Uh, the city council and the city manager were gracious enough to create, uh, allow us to have strategic jobs. So in, in, uh, in Parks and Rec, in public works, uh, in areas like that, the Welcome Center, they created some jobs where we would be doing uh, shadowing mentoring type of thing for these young people. So it wasn't so much about the job because it's not the money for this generation, it's the intrinsic value that this generation is looking for because there's a lot of ways to get money through social media and things like that, but you have to build an inner person for, for these young people to grab hold to something so they can move forward uh, in a true intervention. Next slide, please. So this is what we had. Uh, as, again, it was just me. So I did a, a three hour orientation, kind of life skills, bringing individuals in, finances and um, uh, in agencies and, and talking about wellness and things like that, workforce readiness. And uh, that would be our orientation. And so we placed them on the job and then I was shadowed in, in the job, meaning going to uh, check up on them, talking to them, being the mediator between the employer and the worker, because you have to understand some people have never dealt with uh, uh, high risk youth. And so there's ways you have to communicate. And that that's a part of building the foundation about the, developing the relationship so that when you do place them on the job, you understand the level that they're communicating on. Um, and so once we did that, I was able to kind of be a buffer between the employee if there were issues and the youth so that they continue to work. The main thing, again, wasn't the money, it was about allowing them to imagine something greater, that you have the ability to do something great, but you have to be able to get to those resources. Uh, as far as referral sources, they came from the school, they came from the community, they came from uh, other individuals, they came from all over the place. And, and, and that's how we were able to maintain it. And this is for the first year where, again, that I, it was only, only myself. So the first year, uh, we just did that three hour and we were able to uh, do a project rebuild. Project rebuild 
is about uh, DCC had a program where they could give construction certification, uh, Danville Community College. And so they would give construction certification. One thing that I know about this generation is that they're not going to go to school, the population we're dealing with for a year and a half. So you have to be sensitive to that. You have to understand the culture of the population of youth that you're dealing with if you're gonna be effective in creating an intervention program. So with that, I spoke with the community college and they were able to compress the year and a half uh, uh, construction program to 10 days. They would go eight hours a day, for 10 days and after that they would get a certification and we created project rebuild in that first session we graduated um, seven youth and then they were able to go on uh, if they wanted to continue in school and get an electrician certification and things like that so that was a power pro a project imagine in the beginning so we ran that way for the first three years then we were able to get some funding and then we began to grow the picture you see now is the growth they are able to get some funding and, and some new positions from the city and the growth happened we we, we uh hot outreach workers, and credible messages. Let me give you a nugget on the credible messages. Just because you've been in prison or you have a criminal history doesn't make you credible. What makes you credible is the trauma that you experienced and the trauma that you were able to understand and to overcome and, and then be able to teach other young people how to overcome that trauma. That's what makes you a credible messenger. If I went through a hard situation, a group in a hard neighborhood, and I was able to make it out of, it, out of that situation, now I can come back and talk to you. That makes me credible, not just the fact that <laughs> I've been in prison. So I just wanted to throw that out there. So we were able to do that. And we were also able to uh, get volunteer interrupters, which goes all the way back to the beginning of developing those relationships in the community. And they believe in what you're doing and believe who you are. And so we have volunteer interrupters who now, uh, people in the community would just call and say, this is about to happen, or even intervene while it's happening, shootings and things like that. And uh, that was on a volunteer basis. Uh, we expanded the orientation to five days and we, go, we do strength-based assessment. That is the first class because we have to know what their strengths are and not focus on their negatives, but focus on their strength. And from that strength-based assessment, we create their goals. So they go five days, they get life skills, workforce readiness, we talk to them, uh, have speakers coming in, financial literacy, hygiene, and things, things of that nature. And we give them those, they come in for five days. And at the end of those five days, because from the beginning of Project Imagine Now, we're teaching them the value of their time. And so at the end of the five days, 15 hours, we, we give them $150 stipend, not to pay them, but to have them understand that their time is valuable. But also, if they miss one day out of those five days, you don't get the stipend, we'll still enroll you, but you don't get the stipend because we also have to teach about responsibility. Uh, the referrals now started coming from gang members uh, internally. Uh, we, we uh, in one particular uh, gang, we had like 15 individuals that were referred uh, we, uh, with the extra help, the outreach workers, incredible messengers, we were able to produce a sports-based youth development in order to address uh, the, the, the poverty issue here where uh, individuals were not able to pay for recreation and things of that nature, after-school activities. So uh, Parks and Rec here, because of the pandemic, were, did not have a basketball season. So we were able to uh, mobilize the community uh, by getting coaches from the community, getting referees from the community, and, and using outreach workers, and we created a seven-week basketball program, and the buy-in was that we're going to check your grades, and you're going to do three hours community service, and we had a 90%, 90 percent um, compliance rate on that. Uh, Re-entry program with the new staff, any youth that spends more than 30 days in the detention center, we will pick them up and um, bring them into the program where before uh, we may have missed those individuals that they weren't on radar, but now we, we have a, a MOU with the Department of Juvenile Justice. Now, all of this began just with, if you go all the way back to the other slide, it begins with relationship, and that is the key. It is impossible to create an effective, a sustainable intervention program if there's no relationship with the community and there's no conversation and relationship with the municipalities. You have to be able to... Uh, be an interpreter, meaning interpret the information that's coming from the community, interpret that raw passion, that emotion, and interpret that and create a strategic plan to present to municipalities so they understand the need of the funding. Uh, also, uh, the community college collaboration with employment, uh, we discussed that with um, Project Rebuild. And one thing that I'm really excited about is the Haven, uh, kind of organically, because when my outreach workers came in, they began to do the same model that I did out in the community, hanging at the barbershop. And so uh, organically, 
individuals started coming to the barbershop and asking, hey, where's that, that guy who gives you the job? Where's that guy who helped my kid? Where's that guy that can, can, that can provide help? And so that became a place of referrals. And that became a place where now we call it the Haven where if they tell the barber, the barber tells us, and we, we, we are diminishing some of those barriers of, of getting to certain places or the embarrassment of going into uh, organizations asking for help. Now they go to the barbershop, the barbershop calls us the outreach workers and we go forward on that. So uh, just really excited about uh, what we did and how it was done based on relationships. And uh, I'll hand it off to uh, Celeste. Thanks. Thanks, Robert. And um, that I would just say, Robert, that's just an excellent example of the powerful work that's happening out in the community and uh, how you build a program from ground up and the importance, which is what you spoke about, which was relationships and how um, I think Jim spoke, Jim spoke to that earlier in the conversation. And, and um, Eddie did as well. And I think that's a key to the programs, to these initiatives. And we we, we, some, we refer to them like in OJJDP and, and BJA, I'm sure, as project, but, but they're really initiatives, long-term initiatives. So the funding is there to help you start up, but we uh, look at it long-term so that this is a community-driven project. Uh, this the ideas come from the community and is owned by the community. And the relationships are really important in the CVI work. Uh, that uh, when we're looking at relationships, we really need to be united by a, mi a mission. Something that we um, we look at uh, individually and as a community to say this is what we're trying to address. This is what we're trying to build. And I think the uh, thing that we need to keep in mind is that. Um, we have to look at the larger picture uh, in this work that there are many people that have been doing this, this CBI work, uh, community violence intervention for many years. And I think it, we've come to a point where we're really all of us are trying to learn how to work, collect, work uh, collaboratively and address the issues, not only of youth violence, not only the, of reducing violence or promoting the absence of violence, but also creating those nurturing uh, um, opportunities, nurturing environments for youth to help them grow. And as uh, uh, David talked, uh, Robert talked about the uh, importance of these positive uh, youth initiatives where you're focusing on the assets rather than the deficits is uh, really crucial to this work. And I think that's where OJJDP has also evolved as well as BGA in, um, in how we look at uh, youth and how we uh, provide support to them in the community. So collaboration is really important, working with uh, listening to the community, also uh, bringing in voices from youth, from families, uh, getting that feedback loop. So you're collaborating and you're also working, but working together, but also being responsive to what the community's needs are. And I will say something about, I've uh, been doing uh, technical assistance work for, for quite some time. And one of the things we uh, listen to our grantees about is that when they've perhaps written a, um, a project design, they are working with project design, and they've been working out in the community for some time, they will hear back from the community, or they will see something in the community. And sometimes they'll have to go back and say, you know, maybe we need to modify our approach here, because we're taking in the information from the community, and we're trying to be responsive to their needs. And it's based, again, uh, not only on the the community, what they're saying, but it, it's probably based on, and most likely will be based on data. That's the expectation and um, the assessment that, that everyone's making. But collaboration is really important, uh, whether you're working with probation, community-based organizations, grassroots organizations, neighborhood groups, uh, city and federal officials, it's, it's key to the success of any type of sustainable program. And uh, mutual respect is something that um, was spoken about earlier. And so mutual respect uh, and trust is important for this process too. That doesn't mean we need to agree with everyone, but we need to listen and learn. And I think that's a big part of the process. It's it's not something that occurs overnight. These are long-term initiatives. 
And the frustration oftentimes that people feel when they're starting programs is we can't turn this around fast enough. Well, the prop, well, the issues have been there for a while. It's going to take some time. So it's that um, collective uh, collective process, I think, that's going to really uh, contribute to the success of any type of initiative out there. And um, I'm going to refer back to you again, Robert, because your program is just a great example of that. And we'll hear from other, uh, other panelists today who also have excellent examples of the work they've done out in the field and the work they continue to do. But the opportunities for young people, I think we're learning a lot more about uh, how to be effective in our work with young people. We know probably more about risk factors than pr protective factors. And as we move through this work, um, I say all of us um, working as partners, we're going to learn more about what is needed in the field. And um, later on in this, uh, this webinar, we'll hear from a young person who can talk about uh, some of those those needs and what's really required to be effective in helping youth uh, lead productive lives and having nurturing environments. So we can move on to the um, the next slide, please. So this is a map of where OJJDP has provided support for community violence intervention. As you can see, it's all across the country. Um, we work in rural. The support is provided in rural areas as well as urban areas predominantly um, urban areas. And um, there are many grantees out there now. Some of these are funded and some of them have sustained without, without funding and have uh, continued their projects perhaps through city or county funding, sometimes from different uh, private, uh, private donors, but they've all really been invested in the work for a very long time. So um, there are always opportunities for people who are in need of services to always reach out for um, guidance and to apply for some of these, these grants that come out. So um, with that, we can move to the next slide. Um, and this is just very briefly, this is just some key strategies and approaches of OJJDP funded communities. This is since uh, from 2018 to 2021. And it just really shows you the range of types of uh, grantees that are out there and sites that are working on this initiative. In terms of community violence, uh, we have sites who are providing history outreach, trauma-informed care as part of it. And some of these include all of it, right? So some are group group violence intervention, some may be prosecution, uh, place-based focused deterrence. I'm gonna, if you look at prosecution, oftentimes people will think, well, it might be a suppression program. Prosecution is also working on intervention and prevention initiatives, um, as well as any of the court-based. We have hospital-based diversion programs, incredible messengers, violence interrupters. There's a range of uh, service providers out there that are doing amazing work and um, it's truly impressive how uh, how many of these sites have implemented a number of strategies to address youth violence and uplift youth and families in communities. So that's just a real brief. I went gone through these very quickly uh, in the interest of getting to our panelists, which I think is what all of you are most interested in. It. So with that, um, we're going to move into the panel discussion right now. And um, the, here is a list of our panelists for today. We have Amber Govan, who's the founder and executive director um, crew for Little Rock, um, Arkansas. Um, we also have Donnie Gomez. He's a student, senior program manager for Volunteers of America, Los Angeles. Uh, Harrison Nelly, who will be joining us later in the second part of the uh, webinar is from Volunteers of America Los Angeles also, and Paul Callanan, he's the Director of Office in Safe Neighborhoods, Louisville, Kentucky. So with that, I just want to start off with a question um, for one of our panelists here, and um, Amber, Amber, if you could, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and the work you do, and Talk to us about what it took for you to start a grassroots organization and successfully partner with the stakeholders in the community. Okay, well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Amber Govan, as Celeste said, I am the founder and executive director of Carter's Crew. 
Uh, we are located here in Little Rock, Arkansas, and we have a second location in North Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, we are a nonprofit organization that was founded to educate and empower the most vulnerable youth in our central Arkansas area. Um, the programmatic activities that we do uh, were designed around uh, kind of the supports and the things that my family needed when I was growing up. Um, I started uh, selling drugs at a very young age um, and entered a life of illegal activity very young. Uh, there were people in the community who intervened and provided supports to not only me, but to my family as a whole. And uh, we were able to make substantial life outcome changes to be where I am now. Um, so for our program, um, we work with a lot of people. I think it is very important to stress the importance of a collaborative project. Um, so we have close to 60 community partners all bringing something unique to the table. Uh, we collect a lot of data from our community as well as from the participants of our programs. Um, so we do um, uh, pre and post surveys, evaluations, and as we get that data, we make changes to uh, the services that are being provided to the community. Um, all of our services are free of charge. Uh, we found uh, the funding and are able to sustain our programming through uh, outside uh, funders. Um, we were uh, first, we were just like Robert. Um, we started with no budget, um, just me out using the connections that I previously made through work I've done uh, for the past 10 years for the University of Arkansas and the University of Arkansas Medical Sciences. Um, and so through our programming, uh, we provide some mentoring, we provide case management services, aggression replacement training, uh, which is a combination of anger management, conflict resolution, and moral reasoning. Um, we have a street outreach team who does street outreach. We do outreach events. Uh, we provide job readiness, um, job development, college tours, field trips, family nights, um, and many other additional supplemental services that are provided by our community partners. Um, some examples of those are uh, we do a police interaction class, which is um, some of our police officers come into our centers and they also uh, do some virtual classes with our youth about um, their rights when they're stopped by the police, um, how to interact, whether you're stopped on foot or in your car, um, and kind of who to call if you have an issue with the officer who is stopping you. Um, so we utilize our community partners to strengthen the work that we are doing and kind of address uh, what it is that is needed um, by the families that we are serving. So, um, so you work with 60 partners and thank you for sharing all of that Amber because that's very impressive because I know you also started from the in, in the CV, CVI work you were working already in that area but you you've really done a lot of work within the past couple of years I would say like really it's, are steeped in it. So can you talk a little bit about I know you're working with 60 60 uh, community agents or partnering in some way or working with them. So is it was it hard to get the respect or the the from the grassroots organizations that may have been in this work before or you know you're working in the in the area where there are probably a number of other people that are trying to reduce violence as well. So how talk a little bit about that please. So um, I've always been brought in on community initiatives and model demonstration projects because of my ability to build relationships. And so um, we didn't necessarily start from scratch because the partners that we have uh, know the work that we have done for the university. And so we have always followed through with what it is that we said that we would do. And so um, when we started the nonprofit, it was just a matter of introducing those organizations to the nonprofit and the work we were doing within the nonprofit. So um, it took some time. It took a lot of man hours and uh, a lot of sweat, uh, a lot of footwork. Um, but 
Um, if you are truly passionate about the mission and the work that you are doing, it doesn't truly matter how long it's going to take or how much work you have to put into it. So, um, yes, we did start with a zero dollar budget, but we did have some some good relationships built already because of the work that we've done previously. That's great. That's great. And I love what you said about the follow through that you follow through with things that makes a difference in building trust. So thank you, Amber. I'm going to turn it over to you, Robert. Thank you, Celeste. Amber, just to know, I'm a proponent that if you have access, you don't always need money. <laughs> uh, hi, Paul, how are you? Doing well, good afternoon, Robert. Great, great. Uh, just a question here. Uh, first, tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and then uh, the work that you've done at the city level to connect and coordinate programs operating in your jurisdiction. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Paul Cowan, and I'm the director of the um, Office for Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods here in Louisville, Kentucky. I have 30 years experience working in the gang gun violence reduction field. Um, I have a pretty wide spectrum of the different roles I've played. I've worked the law enforcement side, the suppression side, I've worked the intervention side, providing case management to high-risk individuals, developing uh, various strategies on that. But a large, large portion of the work that I've done and what I've concentrated on is really building larger citywide violence reduction efforts and, and working with cities of how to integrate the different models that are out there, the strategies, and how to integrate that into a model that, you know, perfect for that city, that adjusts that, that works for that specific and unique to that, to that city. So in addition to uh, working over the last, uh, you know, eight years or so with the uh, Office of Juvenile Justice Delinquency and Prevention and uh, the National Gang Center providing technical assistance to cities that are, are building models, uh, I've had the unique privilege to lead teams and the development and implementation of, of pretty large scale violence reduction efforts in cities across the country, uh, in particular, the county of San Bernardino in California, uh, the city of Denver in Colorado, and now the city of Louisville in Kentucky. Awesome. Thank you so much for that, Paul. Celeste? Hi, Donnie. How are you today? Good morning from the West Coast. Afternoon for everybody else. How are you guys doing today? Doing well. Well, 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 Donnie, um, tell us about yourself, please, and um, what brought you to the work. And then, please tell us about um, your organizational, your organization's approach to community violence um, reduction. Sure. So, my name is Donnie Gomez. I'm the senior program manager with Volunteers of America. I've been working with them for a little bit over ten years, but my journey started much, much before that. I am originally from Guatemala. I came to this country when I was 10 years old, when my country was in civil war. And I came to this country, you know, it was a little bit of a class culture. Uh, at the age of 10, you know, where I was in elementary and saw a group of guys that there were the ones, you know, playing basketball, playing handball, playing baseball. Uh, that's what I wanted to do. Uh, come to find out a few months later that that was the local gang. So I joined a gang before I could speak English. So, you know, joined a gang, got involved, uh, went through the system, uh, went to prison. And then from there, when I was released, I was lucky enough that somebody that, that I grew up hating reached out to me and offered me an opportunity to become a, a federal firefighter for the U.S. Forest Service. You know, the beginning that thought he was messing with me because, come on, McDonald's wouldn't even hire me, right? So this guy was telling me I could become a firefighter. But, you know, I, I took that opportunity and, and I became a, a hot chef for the U.S. Forest Service, right? Then from there, you know, I had individuals that started to mentor me. And throughout that mentoring, you know, I ended up going back to school, I ended up getting a degree in social science. So my journey through, through intervention was one of you know, it was incredible because I, I didn't choose intervention and intervention kind of chose me, right? And then it was luckily enough that one guy, that, that director that was doing intervention at the time needed somebody from my community that could reach out to the guys that I grew up with. You know, he had no in, he had no, we call here in LA license to operate in that area, you know, and since I knew all the, all the areas, all the clicks from my guys, then, you know, I was already doing something positive with my life. He decided to employ me. Before we used to call ourselves uh, gang interventionists, 
Now they, they changed the word to community intervention workers. So I started my work from doing outreach from the ground up and, and I loved it. You know, we'll go with one gang and I'll play handball with them and I'll go to another gang and, you know, we'll, we'll barbecue and I'll, I'll grab a group of kids and I'll take them to a $3 theater, right? And, and, and loved every minute of it, right? And I just started to, to learn and learn and learn more to now to the point that I'm blessed that I'm, I'm managing uh, gang intervention programs, gang diversion programs, prevention programs, reentry, marginalized victim programs, opioid abuse programs, shelters. So again, th this journey has definitely been incredible and definitely the change from gang, in gang interventionist to now community interventionist. And, and that's the reason why we changed our work from gang interventionist to community interventionist because we really found out that we weren't just doing gang work, right? We were doing community work. We were helping with homelessness. We were helping with human trafficking, domestic violence, anger management. So really at the end of the day, gang was one of the last issues we were dealing with, right? We were dealing a lot more with social issues and mental health issues. So you know, I was lucky enough to start working with Volunteers of America, which Volunteers of America has been around for over 125 years. But it started as a soup kitchen. Now it has grown nationally to many places where where we support social work, you know, have shelters, work with veterans, work with single mothers, you know, with youth, with kids, you know, upward bound programs. So really try to find a need and bring those resources to, to the communities. You know, I've been lucky enough that when I started gang intervention with Volunteers of America, you know, it was challenging with our staff because again, we were taking on so much, right? We would find out that, yeah, even though somebody referred this individual for, for gang issues, but we found out that they were homeless. They had no food at the table. There was domestic violence thing going on the house. There were other factors coming on, right? So this is where a lot more resources came in working with marginalized victims. And the, the reason that a lot of people sometimes say, well, you know, usually gang members are the ones that, um, uh, victimized individuals, you also have to understand that, you know, that, that violence was learned and there were victims once as well, right? So we got to start working with that. Right now with the uh, opioid crisis, same thing, we had a lot of youth that, uh, you know, are overdoses, don't understand, or they still think, you know, drugs are how they used to be before, which a lot of them are being, being spiked with fentanyl, right? So that was another service that, that, that we were able to, to expand on and take that weight off of our gang intervention programs because in our areas, you know, it's so saturated that, that, that definitely we need a lot more help. Uh, we work through uh, police divisions because it keeps our program a little bit more accountable and contained, right? So I have, for example, in LA, I have three police divisions, which is the Newton Police Division. Uh, just alone in that, in that Newton Police Division, there's a little bit over 50 gangs, right? Then we have the Southwest Police Division and we have the 77th Police Division. So we have about 50 gangs and about maybe eight to, to 16 staff in each area. So we're definitely outnumbered. So in that we have to be very creative and we have to strategize on how we have to work with our community and with our, with our youth. So something that definitely I, I, I make our obligation to do is to hire individuals from, our, from, from those communities we serve. You know, that's a must, but hire individuals that have changed their lives and are willing to change somebody else's life, right? Uh, you know, there were guys that nobody wanted to hire that they've been looking for jobs, ex-scripts, ex-bloods, you know, Southsiders that had a lot of, um, a lot invested, had a lot of uh, um, a big reputation in their communities, right? But they didn't want, they, they didn't want that responsibility anymore, right? So my goal is definitely to hire them and ha have them that reputation, but now use it to, to influence the kids and, and those are our mentors in a positive way, right? And, and that's what we do. We, we hold them accountable for their own communities first. And, and, and my ultimate goal is for them to start to talk, right? We had a, a few communities when I first hired a couple of guys that, you know, they have been killing each other for 30 years, right? So I hired those guys from rival neighborhoods. And in the beginning, you know, they, they were very hesitant. They didn't want to work with me because they knew who I was going to hire, but they understood what the work was. So I finally convinced them with the idea that, okay, you guys don't have to work together. But I know that the magic of, you know, working together sooner or later is going to happen, right? Three months later, 
they talked between themselves and till now it's been over almost a decade of not a single homicide between them right so so that's what we try to do kind of to get a, a lot of individuals to come to understandings and, and through that that's when we start to bring in our services right we do a lot of community engagement so that means that we have to be very visible we do pop-ups we you know we do pop-ups in, in in one of our goals is to make sure that every single gang in, in that area that we serve knows about our services, know what services we have, and not just our services, the services in the community. So we do partner with a lot of community-based organizations and we invite them to come, right? Because I know that sometimes a lot of people feel threatened, right, by agencies, but our goal is to have them understand that, you know, this is a village, we only play a small part and we need everybody's help. So we invite them, we do pop-ups, even in places where they might not want us or like us, we still pop up, get their pizzas, pass out, outreach, and start to talk to the individual so that we can start to uh, get that, um, get them to know each other, get them to know us and our services. A lot of the beginning, a lot of the guys don't want to trust us. We had a situation with one local gang that they thought we were working for the, for the cops, right? So sure, no problem, you know, come, we'll invite you, spend, spend two weeks with me. Right. So, you know, it was a guy that was tatted down from face to toes and he said, sure, no problem. I'll take you up on it. So I, you know, had a meeting at City Hall. I took him to City Hall. I had a meeting with LAPD. I took him to a meeting with LAPD. I had different meetings with councilmen, things like that with the streets, with all the gangs, because I do meet with local gangs. And, you know, he started seeing the work that I do. Right. And once he started seeing that the following week, he called us and he had 20 kids for us. Right. He like, here you go. Help him out. Right. So it's about transparency, being open, but yeah. also learning our boundaries, right? Mm -hmm. We make sure that we we know what we do and what we don't do. Three okay. rules that I have for, for gang intervention is uh, I don't get involved in gang politics, right? Because somebody always gets hurt, right? Mm -hmm. So I try to let them understand that, you know, that's if it's something that has to do with criminal activity, don't get us involved, we don't wanna know. I don't get involved in gang economics, right? Because if somebody's making five thousand dollars a week, I can't offer him a job. You know, making making more than that, right? Until that runs out, then come and see me. I have other options, right? And the third one is, if you're gonna work with us, you have better have left that life behind you, right? Because that's we we don't want to have that perception that you're still the big homie. You you still the one doing things. You know, your your perception is gonna be that individual that this is who he was but this is who he is now and how he's gonna to come to help, right? Mm -hmm. Making sure that we're promoting that on the streets. So, you know, that the work has, you know, I, I've been very lucky that, I, I, like always said, the work chose me, you mm -hmm. know, but I, I'm a product, product of that environment. You know, I was lucky enough that I had a lot of individuals, you know, throughout my journey that every time I wanted to be a stray, they will grab me from my ear, you yeah. know, and, and they'll tell me how it was. And even if I, I didn't like hearing it, I understood that, that they were trying to help me, yeah. right? So that's really the same approach that we do with uh, with a lot of our youth, right? In, in our area, we try to work with the, the most active, the busiest ones, the ones that are doing the shooting, the ones that are doing the instigating and try to find something positive to do with them because they all want something else. Believe me, they all want something else. Is that they haven't had the right individual. That's why to me, it's very crucial to hire individuals from those communities because they used to look up to them for something negative, right? But now they're gonna look up to it for something positive. And at the same time, those individuals that we hire from our local communities, they know their parents, they know their grandparents. So if they get out of line, they'll go knock at their house and let their parents know, hey, you know, you, you, your kid is, is way off doing other things. So sometimes that, 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 you know, kind of intimidates kids into kind of going into the right direction. But at the same time, it has helped us, like for example, in the schools, Right, I'll get a call that, that two gangs are fighting. And so, I'll send a couple of guys from those gangs. And so, you know, they'll fix those problems. But uh again, yeah. thank you again. I've been, you know, been doing this for almost two decades. I know, and, yeah, a long uh, time. I'm glad to be here. Well, thank you, Donnie. And thanks for sharing your story. And I, you know, and thanks for sharing. You you brought up some really excellent points too about the transparency and the, the work that you're doing and the importance of the partnerships. It's really crucial to doing this work, how you how you um you you build those relationships with people across um the community. So um so I will um
turn it over to um, to you, Robert, for the next question. Okay. Hey, Paul, again, I uh, got a couple of questions for you. Uh, uh, one question, but all in the same question. Uh, there's been uh, there's been much needed influx of funding for community communities to implement CBI strategies. Can you talk about some of the challenges you deal with at the city level trying to incorporate CBI strategies into large range of services already provided? And how do you deconflict service services? Yeah, first off, I'd like to say, you know, it's, it's great that we're finally getting a, a large amount of funding coming, coming into the communities. Uh, we're, we're able to develop community-centered programs where, where community groups have the opportunity to voice those programs, own those programs, and, and, and really lead a lot of efforts. I think it's long overdue, and I applaud those um, private foundations and, and government agencies that, that uh, made that commitment to do so. Uh, but let's be real. Sometimes, you know, uh, getting funds is great, right? <laughs> but uh, it, it comes with challenges, right? It, it really does, especially if you, you know, come in with, with federal dollars and, and stuff like that. But as far as cities go, when you're running a city project, it can present challenges to you in two ways, right? Two ways. One is if you're in a city and you're funding projects, for example, in Louisville, we, we're, we're allocating $8 million of American Rescue uh, uh, fund dollars to a uh, CDI project. So we're, we're funding that, but it is passed through dollars from, from the government. So there are four things that, that could pose challenges when you're implementing CDI projects. One, if, if you have a comprehensive model, but you've never built in where a CDI project goes, <laughs> you have to go back and look at your model and readjust it to be able to show that. Because if you're bringing in new strategies, everybody that's involved being very transparent to the community, they have to know what these strategies are and they have to know where these new programs fit into that. So you may have to adjust your, your continuum whenever your comprehensive plan is uh, to reduce violence. The second is um, you're bringing new partners into a project, right? And you have to really understand the relationships of, of groups in the community. And that's probably the number one thing I would recommend to project managers uh, when you're working in collaborations. You have to spend a fair amount of time to understand those relationships, particularly historical relationships, right? We have organizations you guys mentioned before have been doing this work for a very long time, right? There are some relationships where there's strong bonds and let's you know, be honest, there are some relationships where there, there is just no communication. These organizations don't like each other. And before you bring them together, you have to understand that. So when you're bringing in new projects, you really have to spend some time understanding those, those um, relationships and, and how, what do you have to do to maybe build those relationships. Um, it takes a lot of work to put CBI projects in place, right? If you have not done that before, or you, you're a city where you don't have organizations that are, already have these types of projects, it's a big effort to get underway. Right? A lot of often grassroots organizations are the best to, to implement these types of programs, but they may not have the internal capacity, organizational capacity to handle the volume of funds that are coming in. Right, so you have to really build their capacity to, to build as well too. Uh, the amount of training, Robert mentioned and Danny talked about, you know, you have the street experience and lived experience, but that doesn't make you a great case manager. That doesn't make you a great mentor. And there's an awful lot of training that has to go into that. In the city of Louisville, we're implementing six CBI sites at the same time. So. Uh, for us, we didn't have a whole lot of organizations doing this work. So at any given time now, you know, we're looking at 60 new outreach workers that we have to train. And that's just a huge uh, uh, um, um, endeavor to take on. And I know larger cities uh, face the same, same things as well, too. And then that ongoing data collection, uh, you're bringing in projects. You want to make sure the new organizations know how to collect that. And the CBIs are based on, you know, principles is evidence-informed uh, programming means, yeah, we want to put something in place that we know we believe is going to be working, but also we'll be monitoring what we're doing. Because remember, the number one thing is do no harm, right? We want to make sure that we're not harming the community in any new project. And yes, it doesn't have to be a law enforcement project. There are sometimes community-based projects that unfortunately, you know, unintentionally do more harm in the community. So we have to make sure that that's not happening. A uh, big thing to look at is deconfliction uh, and duplication of services. Right? And from a citywide perspective, we're looking at how do we allocate our resources most effectively around the city. Uh, it doesn't really help us if we're, we're lumping all of the same projects in the same two neighborhoods. So it's how do we allocate where the money goes? But then there's the deep collection of services. Right? You have multiple programs. You have CBI right site in neighborhood A, a young person is shot in that neighborhood. You have that CBI site team is responding to that shooting. 
to address, you know, the circumstances around that. At the same time, they're probably dispatching folks to the hospital where the hospital may have all their own hospital violence intervention program, but now they're engaging the individuals at the hospital because that young man who was shot in a neighborhood B, A, is actually lives in neighborhood B, there's another whole program in neighborhood B that might have already been working. With them. So before you know it, you've got three or four agencies tugging at the same individual trying to provide services. So really the ways you can get around this stuff, folks, is really doing your homework. One can be a multidisciplinary intervention team where the agencies come together and work on a coordinated case plan where you can sort of reach friction. You're looking at uh, you know, who works with this client, who has the best relationship with this client, how do the other agencies support that. Um, to create an outreach advisory board where you bring all the head of the agency together and they talk on a regular basis and get to know each other if they don't know each other already. And the most important is the cross-sector development of the cross-sector policies and procedures, right? When you have a critical incident in your community, the last thing you want is organizations kind of arguing with each other or confusion coming up as to who takes priority, who's doing what. Work with all your organizations in advance to come across with these written cross-sector policies where everybody knows exactly what their role is. And just at the very end here, we're going to, as a city, you come across organizations that get outside funding, right, that are not part of your funding that you're giving out. Um, it's a little bit different because they don't have to. Right? They're not depending on, on any kind of city dollars or anything. So you have to build a project that from the day one is inclusive and that you can reach out to groups and help them understand that by working with the city and the city's network, uh, it's really going to support them and really show them how to support them. Thank, thank you so much, Paul. Yes. Thanks. Thanks, Robert. Um, Amber, a question for you about um, working with law enforcement or your work with law enforcement. How do you engage? We've been talking about uh, about partnerships. Um, can you talk a bit about a bit about that? What has your relationship? What have you what have, what has been your work to to um, engage them? Yeah. So. Um... It kind of really took off, I guess, in the last two years, um, but our approach is multifaceted. So um, there are a lot of different things that we do. So we work with the um, both juvenile courts here in our area. Um, we work with their intake officers as well as their uh, juvenile officers. Um, we work with law enforcement, uh, local police, as well as uh, sheriff deputies. Um, and so we do outreach events as well. So a part of our program is to assist with the efforts of community policing. And so we do uh, community outreach events. Uh, we have one coming up uh, next month and they're called Unity in the Community. Uh, during these times, we bring in law enforcement, the juvenile judges, they give a call to action. Um, we have different organizations from the community who have a service to provide to our demographic. They set up similar to how you would at a job fair, but instead of a job fair, they're signing up families on site for resources that they have available. Um, during that time, we also have community members and businesses who provide food for the community. Um, they provide entertainment, bounce houses. Uh, we have the workforce mobile truck that comes out and allows families to sign up uh, for um, resume assistance, looking for jobs, et cetera. But during this time, we also have a donation corner that is usually manned by our um, drug court participants uh, for the county. And... Uh, Families from the community can shop the donation corner and take whatever it is that they need. So um, during this time, the community as a whole gets to see um, their local law enforcement, gets to interact with them, get to see them in a positive light. And we allow um, those uh, law enforcement agencies, first responders to get on the mic and talk about their areas that they serve and what they do and who to contact um, for services. Um, we also work with uh, juvenile judges outside of our county. Uh, so there are some who are interested in credible messengers program. So we assist them with building the foundation of that program and identifying who they need to bring to the table and that kind of thing. Um, we also are now a part of different uh, committees. So uh, we work with the Juvenile Justice uh, Reform Initiative that is through the Supreme Court of Arkansas here. 
Uh, we are part of the data team as well as a part of the service provider team. So we analyze and look at data from across our state. Um, we're also part of the probation system review team for our county. And so we assist um, with looking at probation system and making recommendations. Um, and we're also a part of the Arkansas Juvenile Officers Association planning for their annual conference. So we identify the curriculum and material that the juvenile officers will receive at their conference. Um, and then we just have um, our police um, agencies who come in and speak with the youth. Um, they come to the family nights. We try to um, just have the community engagement officers come by at not certain times, but during the evening time when the kids are on site at our center, have them coming in and interacting with the kids that might be playing basketball, they might be doing activities, and just kind of talk with them and get a better, um, try and build a better relationship between the law enforcement and um, our community. Um, we also have a, a lockbox in our center um, that the community knows that they can drop tips in or suggestions, and uh, we act as a liaison and pass those, that information on. Um, so if somebody drops something in the box and lets us know that there's a beef on um, Main Street, stay out of the area, we're going to pass that along to our community engagement officers as well. Um, we had did have some challenges to working with some of our law enforcement agencies, and um, some of those were just the uh, frequent changes in leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we did was started at the bottom and begin to work our way to the top. And so once you get the buy-in of these officers and resource officers who are out in the community, um, and they, they're coming to the center and they're being a part of your activities and programmatic things that you're doing with the kids, they're going to do nothing but tell their leadership that, you know, you need to get a meeting with them. You need to go out and check, check them out. So uh, even when we had challenges, we just started at the bottom and worked our way up. And so now um, we're even called in to do some uh, professional development. Uh, with some of the resource officers or community engagement officers. Um, so we we utilize our law enforcement in a lot of different ways. Um, we also receive um, data from our crime information system here. And so um, we're able to provide, uh, you know, crime statistics as well. Um, so we utilize our law enforcement officers and agencies in a lot of a lot of different ways. Thanks, Amber. Yeah, it sounds like you've really uh, built relationships and created a lot of opportunities out there. And you covered some of the things that um, you, you commented on the few things that Donnie mentioned too about the resources that you provide. They're not just specific. They might they're really reaching out to the family with your pantries and things like that. So thanks for sharing that. It's well, and of, um, Celeste, I wanted to say one thing too. Um, if you are asking um, kids to come out of the streets or to buy into what it is that your program is doing, you have to give them realistic opportunities that they can they can have. Um, you can't ask a kid who's making uh, $700,000 a week at 14 to buy into your program and not offer them an opportunity or a way to uh, expand or be successful. And I think sometimes we as programs forget um, that you can ask, but you also have to be a realistic. I can't focus on your program if I'm hungry or if my lights are out or if I'm sleeping outside on a, on a street bench. And so we gotta pay attention to those things as well and address the underlying issues for not only the youth, but for the family as a whole. Excellent point. Thank you, Amber. Thank you. Robert, uh, if, do you want to comment on any of the police or law enforcement relations or anything like that? Well, I, I just totally agree. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, so this, this is for you, Donnie. Um, you kind of elaborate on it a little bit, but just touch again on how to you use your relationships and partnerships, including criminal justice stakeholders, 
to leverage relationships for the youth uh, in your program? Well, you know, when it comes to law enforcement, law enforcement or, or the district attorney or the public defenders, a lot of the times the youth feel that they're obligated, right, to kind of get involved. So one thing that I definitely let them know that this is optional, right? You're not forced to be there. You do have that option, right? But we're here to understand you. We are here to understand why you are in this situation. And at the same time, work with, you know, with law enforcement, the district attorney, the public defender, so they can understand also our position, right, and, and our boundaries. You know, we're here to making sure that, that, that we can reduce recidivism as well, right, with, with our youth. So definitely we make it an option and we make it to the point that they understand a lot of the times, you know, youth have conditions that they need to meet when they're on probation. So one thing that I definitely had to understand that we had to do is that I had to put money for staff development. The reason for that was because, you know, when it comes to probation, you're bouncing kids left and right to complete a lot of, a lot of requirements from probation. And a lot of the times our, our kids will get violated because they didn't complete those requirements, right? Because, you know, they had curfew. So if you have a, a substance use cl a class after 5 p.m. and your curfew is at 5 p.m., then definitely you can't make it, right? So some things were unreasonable. So we tried to do some things in-house. So, you know, we pay for our, for our staff to get trained on, on domestic violence, on anger management, on parenting, on substance use, things of that sort that, that we can have in-house, right? That we can have, find a way to bring our youth in. And, and, and uh, the way our, our center is, is set up, it's, it's a safe haven, right? It's something where the youth can come and understand that they're gonna feel safe. You know, they're gonna have activities to do. It's not just gonna be a place where they're gonna come and they're gonna just take classes. But you know, like one you would tell you, we, we have a we have a basketball gym. Hey, we, we got PlayStation, right? We have music, right? We have arts. Every every day we have different activities for them. And it's activities that every time I, I, I move my budget, we get the youth and we ask them, what is it that you guys would like to do? Right. And and we let this also known to uh to, to our law enforcement. Right, because sometimes law enforcement will come to our center, and it's funny they'll ask them, you know, why are these youth in your center? Don't you know that these are active gang members? Well, we want them here instead of being out there, right? So we let them know that it's a process because sometimes they believe that just because they came to us, our center, they should shouldn't commit any more crimes or they should behave, right? So we have to let them understand it's a process. Nobody changes from one day to another. Right, so this is a process that we work with law enforcement. With law enforcement, we work with uh, incident response. Right, if, if there's a, a gang-related shooting or a gang-related crime in the community that we serve, we send we deploy a team of our staff to you know do rumor control to make sure that we see how how we can prevent the next shooting. Right, to find out what happened. There's a lot of the times in the shooting shop. Uh, you know, there, there, there's so many factors going on. It's better to send somebody that knows the community, somebody that, that might have a little bit more insight, you know, and uh, one, of the, one of the studies that was done a few years ago here in Los Angeles was how effective was that? And, and, and the study was that, you know, when law enforcement would go and they wouldn't get intervention involved, about 46% of the time there was gang retaliation. Mm -hmm. When intervention was involved, it was less than 1%, right? So, you know, definitely that embalming that get to know can, can prevent a lot of those future incidents, you know, and, and that's what we work with, with a gang unit. We want, we work with a gang lieutenant and we meet with them, you know, with, with, with our, with our gang, uh, gang uh, with the law enforcement gang team, we meet every week, every Wednesday, right? And, and we talk about incidents, things that happen, hotspots, right? So, so we know where we need to target our services, right? They give us the, the respect to go in before LAPD goes to what they call it, uh, uh, hard hats and boots, right? Where they're gonna go in and arrest people, right? They, they give us that, that, that respect to let us know, well, look, this area is being active. You guys go and, and give services and let them know that they better stop it or else, you know, we're gonna have to do what we gotta do. So we go with resources, we go talk to those gangs, we let them know. And then a lot of incidents, the gangs know, okay, look, it's either you guys or LAPD is gonna come and arrest you guys. Right, because there's no other choice. So we're trying to let you guys know 
that this is what's going to happen, but we also come with resources, right? We come with alternatives, right? So if a kid's out there, you know, stealing chains, stealing phones, okay, so you need a job, you need something to produce income, okay, we have internships, we have those partnerships, right? With the district attorney, same thing, you know, they, they know that they have that option to send the youth to diversion as opposed to incarceration, especially if it's, you know, a petty crime, right? Something small where instead of, you know, going to jail for six months, they can go into a program, right? And, and, and expunge that, that incident that the youth has. Same thing with, with, the, with, the, with the public defender's office, right? Let them know that there are those options when they go in front of the judge, right? Because a lot of our youth, sometimes they were, you know, going to jail for wearing a baseball hat or wearing the wrong jersey. Mm -hmm. And they were going in for six months for something that really, you know, if we can really get them to change their mindset and start to get involved in something positive, then we're preventing that. At the same time, incarceration, you know, we just know that we just learn other tricks in there, you know, where it hasn't been nothing positive, right? So that's what we want to make sure that that we let those agencies know our, what our involvement is and that they do have options. So we do get a lot of referrals from LAPD. We do get a lot of referrals from the district attorney, schools, public defenders, so that they're now they're giving those, those youngsters a chance. So that's definitely our, our, our involvement that we mass out with law enforcement. You know, in the beginning, there was a big push, but, you know, it's just like relationships and, and being open and being clear and, yeah. you know, just letting them know that, they, you know, we're here for the same reason. That's Thank you. Awesome. Uh, go, that's great. I mean, this is a great, um, thanks for sharing all of that, Donnie. I just wanted to jump in real quick. Um, we did have a question and uh, prior to the question, we had a question from the audience about the funding sources. So after I asked Robert a question, I'd like one of you to respond. Amber, perhaps you could talk about the funding sources or the funding sources that you, the, how you support your program. But Robert, um, could you talk just briefly about the evolution of, uh, so I'm asking you a question now, but uh, the, um, the, <laughs> the, the evolution, what you've seen evolve with programs over time. And I know you've talked about this a little bit about social media. Can you right. talk a bit about that? I think it would contribute a lot to this discussion. Yeah, I think uh, the, the concept of a program, in my mind, programs are created to solve a problem where when you do initiatives or systems is what we're talking about now, where you're dealing with a, a holistic approach. And I think over time, more people are moving towards more of that systemic approach where we are addressing all the factors, you know, Maslow's hierarchy needs, all those things that need to be addressed because we understand that that is, is a direct correlation to these young men out here in the street. Um, and so with social media um, and being able to use those avenues in order to um, stay in contact with you, I know probably everyone on this call who works in the youth that having uh, youth inbox them on some media platform, maybe not with their real name, but something, <laughs> you know, their street name. And, we, and, and, and that's the benefit as opposed to 20 years ago, 25 years ago, where we didn't, weren't able to make that contact. We're able to uh, uh, be more personable because they may not, they may have to put up some type of hard exterior in the street, but then they're, uh, you know, sending you a message, wanting to talk or whatever the case may be. Those are the most powerful things. The other things, even in creating um, programs and things, uh, activities for you. One of the things that we're doing that we're just got, getting into, and I'm not, I mean, I don't really play, but we're, we're beginning to uh, form uh, e-gaming, e-sports because there's a, there's a large push towards that and being able to meet those needs. And I think with relationships, we, we have to hear what this generation is asking for and not so much about what we want to give them. And so with social media and, and all these new innovations, it's gonna be some things that we may not necessarily look at as intervention traditionally, but something as simple as someone being interested in, in, in YouTubing or you know being an influencer, there are places where they have these pop up uh, selfie places and things like that. You that that's an intervention. You just have to understand how to uh, develop that into what you're already doing. That it has some outcomes. But if that if that is the the, the thing that is going to uh, give that individual is going to give their ear, or they're going to be motivated intrinsically, if they can go take selfies and post them and feel good and 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 open up that conversation. 
I think that we have to begin to gravitate toward these new things. Something I'm not really familiar with, but the the meta what is the metaverse? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, these are the things we're going to have to start looking at as providers, even though you know we're older and we don't understand them. That's what this generation and that very well could be an intervention if we are able to place that in in a, in a strategic format that has outcomes. So I, that's kind of my take on it. Yeah, I thank thank you, and I, I appreciate that. And I know every uh, you know as we talk about this, there's been a lot of evol there's been ev evolution in the field, right? So overall, yeah. but we look and you've talked about this too before, Robert. Is this um, using frameworks, but really within those models or whatever framework you're working with, you have to really modify things and move it, move with the times, right? Be receptive and responsive to what's happening in the field. So I think that's a big. Um, big lesson and also the systemic approach, you know, to systemic changes and how do you do that, build sustainable changes over time and not looking at, and I'm like old school, right? So I'm always talking about projects, programs, and but I'm <laughs> moving into the initiative phase. But, um, but yes, absolutely. I mean, I think it's uh, systemic changes and how do you build those, whether it's you, whether you do trauma-informed training for everyone in the, that's working with you or in partnership with you or uh, implementing certain tools. And I think I think there'll be like tools uh, available to people that they can um, access available to people that, um, that we'll be providing here. But I think that is like protocols, things like that, that can be standardized. So I just wanted to say that briefly in the interest of time. I know we do have a couple of questions. So if, if we could, if um, Amber, would you mind uh, taking that question about funding? Just briefly talk about like a funding, the fu way you funded the um, program. Yeah, so um, like I said, we started with a $0 budget. Um, we did start getting some smaller grants from uh, state level um, before we were funded federally, uh, which catapulted the number of funders that we had. Um, so we have contracts, um, we have uh, corporate sponsors, so we have private donors, we have community members who are just recurring monthly donors. So uh, what, what I did first to get started, because I saw that was in the chat as well, um, what I did was you always need to create a plan, a, a plan of what it is, what the mission is, what you are aiming to do, and have data to support what it is that you are saying. You can't just take a nicely written story uh, to a government agency and think that you will receive funding or contract. You have to be very solid in what it is that you are doing and the data that you are providing to the funders. And so that is what I did first, was come up with the solid plan. Uh, with the assistance of some project directors from the University of Arkansas, we were able to um, lay out a very nice picture of what was happening in our community, what we were propositioning to do, and how we were going to do that. And so to start, that was the one thing that I did. Um, now we also provide uh, professional development, so we're paid for uh, consulting work that we do. Uh, that money comes right back through the organization um, because I am the founder. This is my baby. I give back to the organization. So uh, even programs that I design for other organizations, that funding comes back to the, to the organization. We have state agencies that we work with, so workforce. Um, I think Robert talked a lot about that. There is funding available through that arena uh, that people don't know about. So uh, reaching out to your local workforce and making sure, again, that you have a solid plan. The school districts. So we are providers of services to uh, our school districts. There is money available through, through that uh, avenue as well. Um, we also are finishing up a children's book. Uh, which will have a series of confidence building uh, for the younger kids. Um, we don't work with younger kids, but something that we have identified by the work that we do through the schools is that 
even the younger kids, our age group is 12 to 17 plus their families, but uh, there is a need for programming for the eight to 11 year olds. And so uh, we are addressing this through our books uh, that we are now uh, illustrating. Um, we also put together a uh, pitch that we did to uh, corporate donors. So Walmart provides a lot of uh, money as well as uh, donations for our community pantry. Uh, we have two community pantries that we don't spend any money to stock. Those are stocked by our community partners and businesses in the community and community members who keep it stocked for our families to shop and get whatever it is that they need. Um, so, I mean, it just depends on what it is that uh, your program or initiative is trying to achieve. We work heavily with those youth who are coming out or who are involved with the criminal justice system and are gang involved or at risk of being gang involved. And so we also get money through the court administration, uh, court administration as well. Um, I also develop programs for the juvenile judges, which they secure the funding to uh, incorporate. So one program that was created was a uh, peer mentor uh, program where we provide a intensive um, tract for the students who the judges have identified as being um, mentors. They come through this leadership workshop that is uh, three days, two nights on site with us. And once those students complete it, they go back and become mentors for the uh, juvenile judges here. And so um, just finding um, who your partners are gonna be for your project or initiative, making sure that you have a solid plan and data to support what it is you're saying that the community needs. So if you're saying that community needs this, make sure you have community assessments, you have the uh, data from the community to show what it is that you are saying is needed. Um, and I think that's that's my spiel. Yeah, thanks, Amber. And that's that really does lead into the um, the evolution, I think, the data. Um, that we've been talking about, like the date, you, one thing you touched on, Amber, and it's been touched on, Paul touched on it, Donnie, Robert, um, with the data, the assessment, and really understanding that there's a, a segment of the population that's that would be the highest needs, those that you are uh, uh, looking to put your resources in those communities, in those areas with those youth and families that are in the, in the most need based on your assessment, based on the data, and then working in those partnerships. Um, so you brought up a lot of um, really great points there. I think um, we are going to uh, talk a little bit more about uh, the services that are provided for youth in the community. So um, I'll turn that turn it back to you, Robert, um, the next uh, question. Or if you want, I can take it. <laughs> I'll take it. You want me to take it? Yeah, you can take it. <laughs> okay. All right. So maybe, um, Paul, if you could talk a, a bit about the programming that you've done for youth uh, through your long career and some of the initiatives that have been set up to help you. Sorry about that. I think the, the key is, is, if you, is uh, and I think uh, Amber mentioned this earlier, you know, if you're, if you're going to ask people to trust you and come work with you, you have to be able to provide them the appropriate alternatives and appropriate services. You can't make promises to people and then not fulfill those promises to them or offer that and assistance. So, you know, programs that are aimed at, at, at working with individuals that are involved in gun culture or the gang culture, you know, they have to be uniquely designed for each person, right? Every person's different. Every person got involved in that culture differently. Every person has a different background. Um, so it has to be flexible enough, no, no matter what program you put in that, you know, you can assess. And I think that's important is have an assessment process where you can assess the needs of, of what people need. 
whether, you know, if you're working with someone, most projects I ever worked with, we break that into different categories, right? There's the safe, free, and alive type of approach. If someone's being shot at and they're being shot at every day, it makes no sense and I'm focused on what school I'm going to get into. I, I have to figure out how to protect them. If you're using heroin or fentanyl, how am I going to address that first before I'm putting other types of programs in place? So that assessment of that, that safety issue comes up first. What is it that we can offer them? What is it that we can work with them on um, making them safe? Once they become safe and they continue to work with you, and that, by, by addressing those needs first, and then you begin to you know, gain that trust, which is really critical to really begin to move them into more of a treatment focus. So with, our, with a lot of the programs, the people that we work with and the programs you're requiring a very diverse group of strategies and services, right? Whether it's education, employment, cognitive behavioral, substance abuse, it's really what those people need in the families, right? And there's families as well too, is it family-based or individual-based? So that's the need for, 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 for a partnership. And really, I think the, the key element, that that's why collaboration is so important because nobody can do that by themselves. You have to have these partners engagement at the front end, just engaging individuals to accept services might be done great by an organization that has that street credibility. That pass off to another organization, another individual that has the ability to directly work with the safety issues, then a pass off to you know the treatment aspects and stuff like that. So a well-defined program that, that moves people through towards an ongoing progress or an ongoing process. Remember, most individuals, there's a lot of relapse that are involved in violence. It's not just one day they stop, even if they're best intended individuals, there might be issues that cause them to go back into that culture and have to pull them out. Thanks, thanks, Paul. And um, with that, if Irma, if you're, and Harrison, if you're on, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Robert, so you can ask a question to Harrison. Are you, can you come on camera? We might be sent now. Yes, let's go ahead and go on. Yeah. Okay, no problem. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead um, and um, Donnie. So we're waiting for Harrison to join us, but what does it take for a youth or an emerging adult to navigate from detention to reentry to successful immersion within the community? Uh, I'll, I'll keep this one definitely brief. Uh, you know, before COVID, we used to do pre-release services, but because of COVID, they, they didn't, they, they stopped letting us in. So definitely in this post-release, one thing that we try to make sure is that we have resources ready upon their release. Uh, LA County is a big county. So we gotta make sure that again, we partner with different entities and understand where our youth are being released and partner with those entities that might have those resources that we're not able to reach in those areas, but partner with them, right? See what interests them, right? Something that's reasonable. And the one thing that we do is we set boundaries with our participants and we let them know our ground rules and also their responsibilities, right? That nothing is just gonna be given to them, but they have to make sure that they earn it, they work hard, right? And, and they participate, right? Uh, try to find a positive mentor in their community because that's definitely, you know, when you come out to the same environment and you come out with the same individuals that they keep on influencing you in a negative way, you need that that positive individual to keep talking to you in, in in the ear and let you let you know that you don't have to go back to jail, you don't have to commit those crimes again. So definitely finding that individual that's gonna help us support, be consistent. That's definitely one of our biggest factors. A lot of our youth fall through the cracks just because we don't uh, keep consistent relationship with them. So we want to make sure you know to our staff that every week we're just finding out what they're doing and what's going on. Sometimes, you know, our, our, our youth think that we're in the beginning, that we're a little pushy, we're too much. We just let them understand, look, we want to make sure you're okay. We want to make sure that if you need services, we're here. Or anything that we have that's new, we offer it to them and say, look, we, we might have a, a job fair today or, or, or they have different job opportunities or different internships, right? Try to find those those services that they need. We, we do have in our offices... Uh, Trauma, trauma involved services, right? A lot of our youth has have, have gone through so much that one thing that we try to do is have them understand themselves, right? Why mm -hmm. is it that you pick to do certain things? Does it really make sense, right? We have a youth that, that will come to me and will come with a business plan to sell dope, right? So I have to break that down and let them understand, yeah, look, this is gonna, yeah, you might make this money right now, but you're gonna end up in prison for so many years 
So at the end of all this time, you made 50 cents an hour, right? So it's really worth it, right? So start to break down that reality, right? Uh, substance abuse services, we do a lot of life skills because a lot of our youth, again, uh, uh, one thing that we try to make sure that they understand this is that they grow in, 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 uh, in uh, being more, more wise, not just street wise, but, but wise with themselves. You know, if you have a job, what are you gonna do with that money? Right. Don't just spend it when you don't have it, you know, but grow, invest, right? Do, do things that, that are going to help you and your family. But definitely one thing that we do is a lot of nurturing and a lot of support for our youth in the beginning, because you have to battle so many years of a, of a different mindset, right, of influence that they need all that support. They need to let them know that, yes, you're loved. Yes, we care about you. Yes, we understand that you're going through this, right? Because if we don't have that understanding and we, we don't let them know that, yes, this is what happens, right? Then they're gonna slip away again, right? So they definitely kids, believe it or not, they might not wanna hear in the beginning, but once they start to understand it and absorb it, then that's when you know we start to see those seeds and they start to grow. But I think that that's definitely in the beginning because they're very delicate when, when they get released, right? So a lot of them just wanna go back to the same thing. So definitely we have to be very attentive, very caring, but at the same time, you know, strict and firm in certain things that they need to accomplish as well. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So Paul, question for you. Um, what available resources or tools are available that you can help the audience with? I think, you know, it depends on what angle you're coming from. Uh, the first two I would look at, recommend for any cities to, to, to look at is when you're developing a bond reduction model is, is, is you know, um, IRR has a, the OJGDP National Gang Center has a really nice assessment process. And really what that is, is you, you look at, you know, what's driving the violence, who's driving the violence in, in, your, in your community. And then you're also looking at a resource assessment that goes along with that. You really have to understand your assets to address violence and what's driving the violence before you can begin moving forward with programs. So really, you know, there are different federal agencies right now. I know BOJ has multiple agencies internal that have different assessment tools uh, that could do, you could utilize. Um, they're very simple to use. They're very easy to use, but they provide a really good guideline of understanding your problem and then you know, your resources that are, that are available to you. In addition to that, you want to look at also, you know, uh, resources that are out there would be, you know, probably the best resources you're looking for are organizations that currently work with youth right now that provide assessments. Um, it's one thing to sit down with an individual and talk to them and get their, their view and understanding of what's going on. It's another thing to be able to provide an accurate assessment of their needs uh, uh, and be able to measure that. As Amber reported about you know, it's not just about providing services, but unfortunately we have to, we have to be very specific about did we, did we achieve goals with individuals that we're working with and the use of uh, whether they're risk needs assessments or social assessments, or we look at trauma releases, you know, assessment, it gives you these guides and, and these guidelines that you can actually track progression of changes in individuals and in whether your program is working. Thank you, good, good information. Celeste. Oh, yes. Okay. So um, we have um, about five minutes. Um, so I'm going to ask a, a quick question to you um, about this one of, one of the questions from the audience. Uh, what do you do to mitigate the risk of violence when you are serving youth from different groups, youth who are not friendly with each other? Amber, could you talk about that in your um, in your role? Yeah. So um, for us, what we do is um, before anybody starts any kind of programming or services or anything, they go through orientation. So during orientation, I lay down guidelines and the rules. Um, our program is voluntary. So uh, regardless of if you are court ordered to attend our program, our program is voluntary. So the kids know upfront that um, any kind of drama or rift or 
aggressive behavior, physical behavior, not aggressive, physical behavior where they are touching another kid, they will not be allowed to come back to the center for programming in person. So what I just we lay down the rules up front. We have a disciplinary code. Um, the kids know that regardless of if they're court ordered, um, if they get in trouble here, we will report that back. Um, and so they try at least to be on their best behavior. We have not had any kind of physical altercation. Um, we have had issues of different cliques, not gangs, neighborhood cliques being in the center at the same time. And what we did was walk through our conflict resolution. And so um, the, we very much set up a scenario outside where each clique was kind of saying what their beef was with the other one. Um, we allowed them to interact, to talk. And then after that, it was squashed because they know that big mama's rules are big mama's rules. The kids call me big mama. Um, it's a sign of respect and I take it as that. And so I'm very stern, I'm very um, transparent with them. I'm very truthful with them. Um, so before they start any kind of services or any programmatic activities, they go through Big Mama's orientation. And so uh, we don't have, uh, we have screaming matches, not going to say that. We do have screaming, we have, you know, cussing back and forth at each other. We do have that, but we have not had any physical altercations between separate cliques. We even had some blood and gang, blood and crips going against other blood and crips who were in different neighborhood cliques. So it looks a little bit different than it did previously when it was just the bloods going against the crips. Now, now here we had uh, bloods and crips in this neighborhood clique going against blood and crips in this other neighborhood clique. And so I just think you just kind of have to um, identify uh, first off when the kids are coming in, um, what types of supports it is that they need. Uh, we take a individualized approach to each youth that we work with. So they might come to us through a community referral tagged as a, a highly respected gang member or whatever it may be, but we always remove the labels from the youth. So they also know when they come here, they're not going to be labeled as gang members. They're not gonna be labeled as at risk. They're not gonna be have, have any of those labels attached to them. Because one thing that I always remembered when I was a youth was all of these different labels that people attached to me. I was at risk of going to the penitentiary. I was at risk of repeating the cycle of my family. So we have unrepeating the cycle. But those labels matter. I always try to live up to whatever it is that they labeled me as. So uh, if they label me as the ringleader, that's what I was gonna be. I was gonna be the ringleader and the troublemaker. So uh, we remove that and we provide them with love and support first off, and then we uh, help the family as a whole. And through the work that we have done with some of the older um, gang members uh, that are part of the families, now their siblings are coming through our program. So um, just building up uh, that respect on the front end before you start working with this demographic, I think is important. Thank you, Amber. And, and I think that's a, a great way, your comments, is a, that's a great way to end this portion of the panel discussion. Um, I wanna, and I'll turn it over to you, Robert, but. Um, I want to thank you all for this great conversation. We always wish we had more time for questions, to answer more questions for you to speak. Um, and we're really grateful for you sharing um, your wisdom with us today. Uh, it's been very beneficial. Um, I'll turn it over to you, Robert, and then I guess Eddie will make some comments at the end. Just want to say thank you. It's been great, great experience, great, a lot of information from uh, a plethora of, uh, of ideas and concepts that you guys have brought to my mind and just uh, get information from different perspectives. Uh, I think it's just great. So uh, thank you. Thank you. I hope that I get this camera ready on my end. So I apologize for the technical difficulties. I had to move this around. All right.
That was as good as it's going to get, so I apologize for that. Mm -hmm. But however, I just want to say thank you for our panelists, um, Amber, Paul, Donnie, and uh, thank you for our both moderators who did an amazing job, Robert, Celeste. It's incredible to hear both your experience, uh, so many years combined. I mean, when I look at the people in this room, I think about just my, my, my hunch here is that we probably collectively have over 100 years of expertise here, right? So if we can if we can't help solve some of these issues and then, then I'm not sure who can right um, I, I do want to express a couple of thoughts here and you know when I think about those my last year at the YMCA where I, I had about 12 or so participants in our program young young people pass away uh, because of gun violence and I think about just my last job at Ray Chicago where uh, I was seeing you know, five years that I was there we lost about 40, close to 40 men in the program. I, I have to think to myself that I'm really shocked that those numbers were much, not much higher than that. But it's possible that, and according to the data, that perhaps the interventions that we were doing were actually working. When I think about what I heard in this conversation, the thing that stands out to me the most is that we do need partnerships to provide wraparound services. We do need to pull ourselves from our silos uh, to be able to give a little bit of our own culture organization right to address these issues. Um, and that means working differently at times. What I also heard from several folks here is the importance of really having an accurate assessment of, of the people that we're serving and sometimes even of the staff you're hiring. I think about today and day, the best analogy that I can give is, you know, given COVID and given the, you know, we're about to enter the flu season. How many colds, how many flus are we going to be grappling with? And people will probably, you know, jump to conclusion they probably have COVID. But there's a process that we're taking here to really, uh, you know, figure out like what is the kind of cold, what kind of virus do you actually have? And then the last thing that I'll say related to that, it's no different when we think about cancer and cancer treatment. When, when I think about those that we're trying to serve here, we, the field in general, uh, need to continue to um, elevate the way we do this work in the sense of how are we diagnosing, how are we assessing, and you don't have to be a clinician to, to just to see that an individual, right, uh, there's needs and it needs to be filled, but there are also other individuals that are acutely uh, at risk and that their support services sometimes surpasses the limited resources that we have, and that's why collaboration is really critical in this case. Um, so I just want to say thank you for that. Uh, in closing, and as we wrap up, I'd like to take a moment to also acknowledge and celebrate with you. you know, two weeks ago, the Department of Justice announced uh, a grant awards totaling up to $100 million to help communities across the United States to reduce gun crime and other serious violence by implementing, expanding, or improving CBI programs. The announcement was made during a visit by the Department of Justice to Baltimore, Maryland, home to three community-based organizations receiving funding under the Department of Justice, the Office of Justice Programs, to address community violence prevention and prevention work. The awards funded in part through the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act mark a historical investment in community violence prevention programs from the department. And it is a cornerstone of a lot of our current administration's work, and it is one of our priorities here at the department. As you heard from our panelists regarding their work and challenges, the resources will develop and expand the infrastructure needed to build community safety and strengthen neighborhoods. They will support holistic cross-agency collaborations, seed new efforts, and fund expansion plans in both community-based organizations and local government agencies, provide funding and assistance through intermediaries to build the capacity of smart organizations. We recognize that not many organizations that are probably listening today um, often qualify uh, for some of these uh, resources, which, which is why we're acknowledging and finding ways to support that. Uh, other technical and aid uh, to jurisdictions that did not receive federal funding and invest in research and evaluation to better understand what works to reduce violence is also a part of of ours. We know that much more is needed, but we hope this is one of many steps forward that will allow us to build the ecosystem of community safety. Please join us for our next month webinar as we go deeper on the importance of trauma responsive and CBI practices. On that note, I want to thank you for joining us today. 
please help us to continue to spread the word. Please tweet, put on your social media. Uh, it is, it is, there are things that you could do that the Department of Justice we cannot do. And part of it is legitimizing the work that we're doing here collectively. And so I want to take a second to thank you. Thank you all folks who took the time to be here for these two hours and look forward to our next conversation. Have a good rest of your day and week.